Welcome to the Scottish Rite Journal podcast and audio excerpt of the Scottish Rite Journal, published by the ancient and accepted Scottish Rite Southern Jurisdiction, Mother Supreme Council of the World. This week's article, Esotericism is a Matter of Degrees, by Arturo de Hoyos, 33rd Degree, Grand Cross, Grand Archivist, and Grand Historian, and can be found in the March-April 2017 issue of the Scottish Rite Journal. Is Freemasonry esoteric or not? Well, the short answer is yes. No. Well, maybe. Esotericism is any topic intended for or likely to be understood by only a small number of people with a specialized knowledge or interest. Now, this certainly applies to Masonry. But on a deeper level, and in a Masonic context, the word esoteric is usually taken to mean that our ceremonies and rituals allude to realities and or truths not generally understood, or which may have a spiritual component to them. Now, the term is tainted to some people and acceptable to others. Hence, it may not be easy to wholly accept or discard the term esoteric masonry. Now, it's kind of like an onion. Each esoteric layer successfully builds upon the other. We can all agree that masonry is intended to be understood by few, and that it's a kind of specialized knowledge. Ah, but the questions are, what kind of specialized knowledge? And are they real secrets? Well, depending upon one's inclinations, the Master Mason's degree has been interpreted in a variety of different ways by different persons. For some, it's a story of fidelity. For others, it teaches hope in the immortality of the soul. It's a lesson in alchemy. And yet, for still others, it alludes to the discovery of entheogens. Some see it as multifaceted or a combination of various things. But as Brother Hoyos has written elsewhere, we should avoid trying to enshrine our preferred interpretations as the true one. Since 1717, there have been over 1,000 Masonic degrees created. The most popular survived and are included in many of the rites, orders, and systems we know today. Now, like a meal, each degree is only as good as its creator. A recipe may include many of the same ingredients as other meals, yet taste completely different. Similarly, we may have seen many of the same ingredients or features in a number of degrees which teach completely different things. The predilections of a degree's author affect the content as much as the taste buds of a chef. Anyone who has traveled a bit can tell you that even the flavor of the foundational degrees, Craft Blue Lodge Masonry, can differ immensely from state to state, and more so if you compare these degrees across the Scottish Rite, York Rite, Swedish Rite, RER, or something else. Now, in the higher degrees, the differences are even more dramatic and pronounced. Some are philosophical, others practical, some present allegory and others offer discourses in symbolism or quasi-historical themes. In something like the Scottish Rite, the same degree may have dramatically different rituals, depending upon the jurisdiction. So compare, for example, the southern jurisdiction with the northern Masonic jurisdiction. The 20th degrees are nothing alike. When someone describes himself as an esoteric mason, it often means that he perceives and embraces what appears to be aspects of the Western esoteric tradition in our rituals, i.e., some affinity to the symbolism of Hermeticism, Gnosticism, Neoplatonism, Kabbalah, etc., Freemasonry is an eclectic organization, and at various times we have borrowed the language and symbols of these and other traditions. Now the question is, do our rituals really teach these things as realities, or do we use them to stimulate thought, or both? As we're told in the 30th degree, Night Kadosh, we should not mistake a symbol for the thing symbolized. 
Now, in some cases, we believe that is what has happened, while in others, we also believe that we do indeed have vestiges of other traditions. But even when they're there, they may be only one layer thick on our Masonic onion. And the problem is twofold. Now, some deny any esoteric influences at all, or assert that they're just used symbolically, while others claim it's the main part of the onion. Well, if the matter is open to interpretation, not defined by the ritual itself, who has the right to decide? Well, this much we know. Many of Freemasonry's symbols were used before the modern fraternity existed, 1717, and they appeared in a variety of books. Some were educational and philosophical texts, and others in hermetic or alchemical works. Consider, for example, a 1615 engraving by Gabrielle Rollenhagen, in which a woman holds a square accompanied by the motto, Serve a modem. Keep in measure. Example, square your actions. The image was redrawn and appeared in choice emblems. Divine and moral, antient and modern. Reference London, 1732. Another example is Cesare Ripa's Nova Iconologia. Reference Padua, 1618. That depicts a man holding a level and a square with the motto, Ordini Drito e G. Justo, ordered, right, and just. Now, in the same book is another image of a woman holding a square and compasses as a symbol of perfect work. The moral symbolism of these working tools is something which has gradually introduced into Masonic ritual. Books like these would have been familiar to the educated members of the Premier Grand Lodge, and they might have inspired some of our symbolism. Now, as has been said, we're an eclectic organization. So, ask yourself, how many times have you seen the square and compasses or the all-seeing eye used and abused in Hollywood and elsewhere because, oh, it looks cool? Well, I'm willing to bet that at least some of our symbols migrated into the fraternity the same way. An unknown degree maker in the 1700s saw something he liked and dropped it into the ritual. Now, that's not necessarily bad, but 225 years later, his personal predilection turns into a debate. And, by the way, the all-seeing eye in a triangle was a well-known symbol of the Christian trinity— long before it was associated with Freemasonry. Now, certainly there are clear examples of borrowings from esoteric texts. A version of the 14th degree, Grand Elect Perfect and Sublime Mason, as it was called then, used by the Supreme Council of Charleston from about 1801 to 1822, includes a portion of a lecture on Hebrew numerology, or gematria, extracted from Cornelius Agrippa's De Occulta Philosophia, 1531-1533. to If asked if that degree were esoteric, the answer probably would be yes, while to its counterpart in a later version or in another Supreme Council, one would say no. Well, the point is to quit quibbling over such things and find the common ground where we can best work and best agree. If esotericism interests you, well, that's fine. If not, that's also fine. Brother De Hoyos' personal library is well stocked with enough material on both sides to make anyone think in favor of or against virtually any position. The important thing is to be well-educated and understand what we know first. Before you reach for the stars, make sure your feet are firmly planted on the ground. Make yourself into someone who can be taken seriously. Learn the facts about our origins based upon what we know. Brother De Hoyo sometimes speaks about historical records versus hysterical documents. Before you buy into such fantasies as Freemasonry descended from the ancient Egyptians, get a quick education. Now, here are three books to give you a reality check. 
First, Harry Carr, World of Freemasonry. Second, Bernard E. Jones, Freemason's Guide and Compendium. And third, David Stevenson, The Origins of Freemasonry, Scotland Century, 1590 to 1710. When you can speak intelligently about the old charges, Gothic constitutions, early Freemasonry in Scotland, the foundation and formation of the first Grand Lodge, and how when the degrees developed, people may be inclined to listen to you. When you start to talk about more exotic things, educate yourself well enough to argue both sides of the argument. Take due notice thereof and govern yourselves accordingly. Now, don't forget, you can read the Scottish Rite Journal anytime by downloading the Scottish Rite Journal app. It's free now in your app store. The Scottish Rite Journal is published by the Supreme Council, Ancient and Accepted Scottish Rite Southern Jurisdiction. The illustrious S. Brent Morris, 33rd Degree, Editor-in-Chief, Copyright 2018, All Rights Reserved. Any citations for this article can be found in the corresponding print edition of the Scottish Rite Journal. I'm your host, Bob Chase, 33rd Degree. Thanks for listening.